Lucky stuff, I'm sure you'll admit. I'm sure you'll agree. Please welcome to the stage the creator of your Scott Henrik Bjorn and the star Moa Gamel. Hi. Hi. Welcome. welcome <laughs> so to nice London. to be here. Thank you. Welcome to Hi, London. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Henry, let's start with you. Um, we're used to, in, in Britain on British TV, we're used to seeing quite a lot of Nordic noir, we call it Scandinavian crime thrillers. Yeah. Did, was that steeped in your blood when you decided to come up with this series? The Nordic noir? Yeah. No, was the, um, the whole um, uh, urge for me was to do, do this particular story. Uh, and I was not so interested in doing another Nordic crime. Uh, it was to tell this story, which is uh, in a way an enhanced reality. It starts like a police series, but where, where we start in episode one is not where we will start as end in episode 10. Uh, Moa's uh, character takes quite a journey. So it was not a purpose that we're going to do another uh, Nordic Noir thing. It was just, I, w I need to tell, I have an urge to tell this particular story. What came first, the, uh, Moa's character, the detec the, the, this detective who suffered a great loss in her life and has her own kind of personal issues as well as this plot or did this, the idea of the missing child and investigating that or even the setting, which what was the thing that came first, do you remember? Well, um, beside uh, Moa's character, Eva, there's another main character and that's the, the nature, the forest and the mysteries. Uh, and it's in a way based on, on Swedish folklore, you can almost say. So that was probably, there's a couple of years ago now, but what came first? How, how can I tell a story that has actually that is entertaining, that is exciting, sometimes scary, but also has a message. Uh, so that's how it started. And, and the, even the title, Jordskot, came to me the first day. And it's also, for a Swede, loaded with some kind of maybe mythology and, and something that's old and from the past. And then I started to, to build a story around a mother's uh, search and sorrow for a missing child, and, and then it sort of became 10 hours top drama. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Seven oh. years later or something. Yeah. Yeah. And did you always have Mo in mind for the character? Did, was it, did you even write it for her or was, did the casting come later? That, that's, I mean, from the very beginning, I didn't even know if this is going to be a book, a computer game, or <laughs> a short film. Or I just needed, I, I've been working with commercials for many years as a direct film director. So I, I just wanted to write something that came from my heart, sort of. So when it, many years later, when we had a uh, you know, storyline and we really understood this is going to be actually a series, then the casting began. And then I saw uh, a film together with my producer, Philip Hammarström, uh, uh, called Tommy, which uh, uh, Moa stars in. And I said, that, that's the one. How do we get hold of her? <laughs> sort of. So what did you think, Moa, when you first got the script or when you first approached? What did you think with the whole idea of the story and the project and the character? Um, the, the whole casting process was really like opposite of what I'm used to because Henrik phoned me up before the audition and told me all the, this story about this character and I was sort of pissed off because I was like, okay, now I want to do this and it sounds like you already like decided which he, he, he had done but I didn't know that <laughs> beforehand so I was like, fuck, I want this, you know <laughs> and uh, sorry for swearing um, <laughs> Um, and then I met with Henrik after I got the part and I was like, okay, this guy is brilliant and a bit crazy and I love that. <laughs> and he pitched me the whole like universe and the idea and, and it was really thrilling because I, I hadn't heard about a project like that before like ever. So sure, sure. it's really exciting. Yeah. And what did you think of Eva, the, the, your character when you first read her? Um, Eva is a really complex character because she's both this really competent negotiator for the police force and still this grieving mother so she's very very strong and very fragile at the same time and you could play around with those kind of opposites playing Eva and that was really challenging and, uh, um, and uh, yeah, an amazing process actually that character to get to play a character that's so complex yeah yeah and did you know did you know the whole story so you obviously you got the script you, you knew the, the premise I guess the kind of initial idea did Henrik explain exactly how the whole story is going to play out did you know how it was going to end um, yeah I sort of read all of the scripts and they were so really page turner so I was like what's happening next what's happening next and I was like okay this is a good sign because if I feel like that when I'm reading the script hopefully the audience is going to feel that as well when they see it 
And were you a fan of this kind of drama, this kind of crime thriller kind of genre, which I'm sure the show, as it plays out, goes beyond that, but that initial idea of a detective and that kind of thing? Um, no. We had a lot of those shows in Scandinavia, so I think I was more excited for the twist in it. And, and there was like a mysterious thriller as well. It had different elements than I was used to when I watched like other crime stories. Uh, so I think I liked it because it was different. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the key elements, I guess, is that, you're, that Eva has this big loss in her life about um, losing her child. And in this clip we're going to see, we'll see some of that explored. So let's yeah. have a look. That's a very powerful idea, isn't it? The, the disappearance of a child and not knowing why and how she would disappear, even though you're there and you're the last to see it. Was that, had you, had you heard of true stories that inspired that idea or was it, was it just one of the ideas that really meant a lot to you and that you wanted to explore yourself? But, I mean, it's uh, a, a situation that's the biggest horror you can imagine, of course, and uh, it was, uh, we needed to have a premise in the series that was really on the edge from, the, from this uh, situation, uh, this is a dream that you have from, from, from your past, what really happened, that, or your version of what happened in this particular scene. But from this, we can, we can uh, really tell the, the audience that uh, Eva has been through the, the worst horror possible, and she will not compromise to find the truth. Uh, so we needed something that was really you know, hard <laughs> and uh, uh, breathtaking in a way. So yeah, we, we went all the way with that. Uh, what's, did you film that scene? That's a flashback scene, as you say, like you're thinking of that back in your mind. Um, did you film that? What, at what point in the film did you film that very important scene? Because that's, that's putting you through, through it emotionally, that's it. Yeah. We kind of filmed it in the middle, in the I middle, think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, and that's always a challenge when you're making a series, because you always need to know in your head what your character's journey is and in what kind of development she is in that particular scene. So. Uh, I had this really intricate system in the script where I wrote what, what have I been doing before, where I'm going, okay, what am I doing in this scene, to really know uh, the character's emotional uh, pinpoint. So, yeah. oh, okay. And we saw that, I mean, that's a beautiful setting, that forest. So that's outside of Stockholm, is that right? That? Yeah, it's quite close to Stockholm. Uh, I mean, one and a half hour something drive. And, and we needed to find when, when we, we were... Uh, green lighted on this project, me and my producer, we said, how can we find a location that has all these very special yeah, locations? Uh, we, we need to be on one, one place and then like uh, three miles away, we're going to find all this. And, and as I've been in the writer's room for two years and now I'm taking on the director's hat, it's, it's, it's another situation because, okay, we have some really cool scenes here and, and quite hard to film. And how will we, will we find this? So we were really happy when we found this little town of Sala which has a uh, silver mine, forest, small community, and so close to Stockholm. So actually, we, I think we had about 150 days on set for these 10 episodes, and we had one day in studio. The other, other 149 days is on real location, in real people's homes, you know, so, because it was all, also important for me. One influence is, is uh, uh, yeah, George Lucas, the old Star Wars films, for example, <laughs> where he created this universe that, that felt solid and, and a bit, you know, with the partner and, and a real universe, although it had, you know, the two sons, so <laughs> everything. You, you, could, you could, as a child, I could really believe in that. And that was one influence. We're going to build Silverhöjd and, and the area that it's, fe even though the script is sometimes very enhanced, you have to believe it. So I was so happy that we could find real locations. So, yeah. And the whole, the, the, the setting and the kind of the use of the forest and it which becomes, starts, it looks beautiful there, then it becomes really creepy and horrible. Mm -hmm. Was that, was it everything that you, was it what you visualized when you were writing that this was going to be the key? You always have a, a vision and then reality hits <laughs> and it's budget and timing and so on. But, but I think uh, also our heritage from commercials, you know, <clears throat> attention to details. I'm going to tell a story in 30 seconds if I do a commercial. Now I'm going to tell it in 10 hours. Of course, there will be compromises, but also you get inspired by the environment that we pick. For example, the, the mansion where Eva Turnblad lives ga gave us a lot of opportunities that we couldn't, you know, uh, came up in, in our heads when we sat in the writer's room. So it's a give and take situation, but you always lack time, always. It's, it's a to I don't think yeah, people can understand actually what a time pressure we're under. We have two takes on you and two takes on you, and then we have to move on. And, and uh, as a commercial director, I could work 
over time sometimes. But here I have my first assistant director who sort of, you have uh, 10 minutes more for this scene now, then we have to move on. And I was like, 10 minutes? This is, I've been dreaming of this scene, you know, for two years. You, I, I need more. <laughs> but, but it, it, but, but yeah, it so. looks fantastic. It looks incredible. I and mean, we're used to TV shows now looking beautiful, but uh, the lighting and the photography and everything about it does look, it looks incredible. So all of that was done on, on a pretty tight budget and a pretty tight schedule. Yeah, I mean, a normal budget for a Swedish drama. But I think uh, the, the reason that we have, we, we said from, from the very beginning, this is going to be a stunning film uh, series when it comes to the visuals. And, and all my friends in, in the crew, from production design to DP and so on, we've been working many, many years with commercials. So we, we had a very clear plan. And I want, uh, you could have a freeze frame of Jordskott and see, okay, that's Jordskott. We, we tried to find a look that was consequent and, and uh, uh, quality all over. And I think we succeed because in Sweden, it's been a huge success in Sweden actually, and, and stopped airing a couple of weeks ago. And we had a lot of um, talk about how, how this looks so good. What happened here? Yeah. <laughs> how did he do it? Yeah. Did you have a new camera or something? You know, <laughs> so questions like that. But it's, we, we put a lot of love into this. It's, sure. a, it's actually a, a love for film project. Yeah. That was even our sort of slogan, which is really cheesy, but for the love of film, you know, oh. when, when you're under pressure and it's bad weather and it's, you know, the timing is, and we, why are we here? We're here to create something. Yeah. It's, it's not just fulfill the, sure. you know, TV time. We, we need to do something sure. from our heart. So, yeah. And as an actor, what was it like working? What was the atmosphere like on set? Was it, was it, did you, did you feel the pressure to do the scenes quickly or did you have, did you feel um, you had enough time to play it? I actually love to uh, try to nail the first take. I love that kind of energy it brings that when you really need to have at least one great take, you know, and almost working like you do in the theater, like it's now and here and you can't, you know, mess it up. Uh, so I kind of like it, and, and the setting that you talked about really helped you get into the character and to the world. Because when you're filming in a studio, that's so much harder when it's like lamps everywhere and you can see that it's fake. Now it was for real, and that, it was like stepping into a fairy tale in a way. And when you watch it back, when you, when, obviously when, when you're in the middle of filming, I guess you watch some dailies and everything, but when you watch it back, were you surprised by how it looked and how the whole kind of that, that beautiful look? Yeah, yeah, because you're really in this bubble when you're yeah. filming and you have no clue if it's going to be great or bad, if people's going to like it or not. It's like you're so like just into the project. And uh, I really felt that, oh, please, God, let <laughs> people watch this and love it because everybody was so passionate about the project. And it's so sad when passionate projects doesn't really get received well. So we were so happy that it was so well received in Sweden. Absolutely. Well, we'll see, um, we see more in this clip coming up now, more of your story, I think. And this cunningly explains a lot of, fills in a lot of the details about your life and why you're in this setting. Let's have a look. You're very good at not giving too much away. And that, that scene shows very much, you're kind of en enigmatic. You're not quite sure yeah. how to do with the things. Yeah. She's a good uh, poker player. Yes, yeah. very good poker player, yeah. <laughs> I get a lot of the, um, the the dramas we've seen coming from Scandinavia and, this, and, and a lot of ones featured in this kind of what we call Nordic noir to have female, very strong, three-dimensional female characters at the at the top. Was that the key for you? Was it very important that you wanted to explore a woman's story or female? Descent? Yeah, I think so. In in Jorskot, we we have a lot of strong female characters. Uh, not only Eva Turnblad, Noah's character, uh, from different ages, from from child to to, to really old woman. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that, all, that was important for me. Actually, and for you, so. is, it, is it exciting the fact that women are getting, you know, these, there's a whole load of very, you know, multi-layered female characters in this kind of show now? Yeah, and I think that's the allure as well, because maybe you're used to like the Hollywood way with like this 25-year-old uh, girl who's with this 50-year-old man, and it's like, does life really look like this? And I think that you can really relate to these female characters and that they're also like 30 plus, most of the leads. That, that kind of unusual, I think, in, in movies. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 I know you're taking part in the festival this weekend, Nordicana Festival, which is all about this, this stuff. Did you, are you guys aware of just how popular it is here? Is it something that surprises you? Do you know why, why we're all so obsessed with these shows? Uh, we haven't been there yet. We're going no? there tomorrow. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> but yeah. no. But of, co of course, we have an idea of that, uh, that it's uh, uh, big here and, and becoming even bigger. And, and uh, we have of, of an obstacle with the Swedish language. We're like nine million people in in the whole of Sweden, and you are nine million here in London. So of course, we're a small country. But there's a lot of, of good filmmakers, good actors, and, and good ideas in, in Scandinavia. We have 
awful weather. We have <laughs> we just sit inside and, and write dark during emotions. during yeah dark emo during winter. So, uh, but we just came from from Germany, for example, and the same thing there. They're, they're very fascinated by, by Swedish crime, and, and this really shook them, I think, with Jordskot because it came uh, from another angle and, and still keeps the integrity and, and the quality of Nordic noir, but adds a new thing into it. So. I think it's also w what we understood in Sweden was that people now were uh, mature for a new thing because we've been seeing a certain kind of, of um, drama for a long time, crime drama. So to add this new stuff that we are, people were appreciating that. And that's what we have, uh, you know, hardcore fans in Sweden. We have, if you go on Instagram, you see fan art, uh, hundreds of, of things that people have painted or created or photos and so on. And that's very rare for a, for a crime to get that kind of, and I'm, I, I come from kind of a geek culture myself, so I know that we would we have... We can tell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so I know we, we would have a core of fans, yeah. but it was became much bigger than we expected, and, and we had a, a young audience, but also an older audience, and, and a lot of female, a huge female audience, uh, because it's, you, ha you have some, some uh, horror, and you have some action, of course, and stuff, but you also have the, the mother's struggle, which uh, uh, Moa did so perfectly well. So, so we, we met a broad audience with, with um, and also, uh, as you say, in Sweden we say play service, but, but yeah, people watch on the internet and on old school TV, right, both, right, right. what yeah. was, you know. Sure. Well, here it's, it's on ITV on Grand, it's on iTunes as well, so you can, yeah. Exactly, it's it's like, like in Sweden, so. Yeah. And yeah. another detail, after every episode it was trending on Twitter. Oh, wow. So the, the most talked word wow. <laughs> in, in Sweden was George Scott, so of course yeah. we, yeah. And how does an that impact. affect you as the phenomenon of have the fans and what, what kind of response do you get from people in Sweden? Um, I was like, um, I did three movies in a row before I did George Scott. And there was like really, some of them were well received and some were not. So I was kind of scarred from having to read like others' opinions of what yeah. I have done, you know, and what the film was about. And I was like, okay, no, I'm not going to read anything about the show. Uh, I'm not going to read any reviews because I, I'm only going to get sad. <laughs> like, and then Henrik couldn't help himself, like <laughs> sending reviews and sending stuff that people said. But so, it was so good. So, so it slipped know. in, you know. And, <laughs> and it was, you know, all the love that I received from uh, children from 10 years old to ladies in their 80s. You know, it's like I, I've never really experienced that kind of aged rage before uh, that people watched it together with their families and stuff mm. like that because yeah. it's very fragmented today how you watch sure. movies. Everybody has their own screens. Yeah. And it's so nice in a way to be able to uh, gather people around the screens again for like a family thing. Yeah. So people were talking about it as, as a kind of like a social event. Like in, in a kind of big event yeah. TV kind of way. To become a part of, of um, a bit pretentious, but part of the pop culture actually, because yeah. if you also see how, how people are um, putting up pictures of, of George Scott that you could only understand if you've seen the series, because it's kind of internal between our, you, you see George Scott, I see George Scott, and we can joke about this or we can do a, some, something about it. So, and also from the beginning, the first episodes, people were tweeting and so on, I will never put my foot into a wood, into, into <laughs> the woods again, or yeah. I will never go into the forest. But eventually, that's n that is not the message that, that you should be scared. It's more of respecting nature. So uh, eventually, when people understand that, they were, it changed. So, so people are now out in the forest of Sweden taking photos, hashtagging George Scott, and appreciating you know, old treats and so on. So, so I, I think the message came came through no, so yeah but you say that but in this clip we're going to see now it's quite scary <laughs> as we, have, we have some scary yeah. moments yeah. as well yeah let's have sure. a look <laughs> that's almost like a horror film that <laughs> sequence, isn't it? is that is is that kind of thing i mean the show does have all kinds of different takes all kind of twists and turns and isn't just a straightforward crime drama what what kind of th you mentioned the star wars George, what kind of other influences do you have uh, of course, when, when, in, in everything you do that's creative, you have a lot of influences, but it, it is actually my childhood that is the biggest influence, and that sound, might sound like I have a terrible <laughs> childhood, yeah. but uh, my grandmother had a lot of, of fantasies, and she, uh, when I was 9, 10 years old, she took me out in the forest and, for long walks, and I, I sort of hated that from the beginning because I want to sit and draw stuff or play football, but she took me out in the forest, and then she told me about events and, and tried to learn me, uh, so it was sort of half fantasy, half... Uh, you know, teaching. <laughs> so she could say, for example, we shouldn't go there today, Henrik. Let's take this path instead. Why shouldn't we? Oh, don't ask. We, we should just leave them alone. Okay, leave them alone, whatever. Oh, and in a way, I know she was telling a saga, but 
we could, we could have a bath uh, uh, in, the, in the little lake. And she said, let's go be careful to the water so we don't wake them up <laughs> and stuff like that. So of course, I'm influenced by maybe there, there is a kind of soul in the forest. And I think everybody can relate to the, the feeling of walking in a, a deep forest and feel that someone is watching. It's not necessarily scary, but it's some kind of, I, I shouldn't go there, let's go here instead. The, the, the woods have eyes in a yeah. way. And it's about, about uh, if, we, if we can f uh, feel that the, the forest has a kind of soul, this is yeah, a, a bit off, but if, if we could really appreciate that, then we, I think, would see upon nature in, in a different way. So that was, I think, one inspiration. And then, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yep. Any more? No, no, I mean, okay. <laughs> upon that, of course, there's a lot of films, books, and comic sure. books and stuff that, sure. that uh, I have consumed during mm. the years mm. and try to put it down into the story. Were you constantly, were you trying to find out what these influences were on the kind of tone and the atmosphere that he was going for, or did you just I do was your like, is Henrik crazy <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> or not? Yeah. <laughs> Should you have an answer yet or not? Uh, no, but it was really, I bought into the world entirely, because, but I'm also like a nerd from the beginning who loves fairy tales and fantasy and, and this whole like level of, is, is the world, is this all there is, or is there like another level that we don't know about? And I love that kind of thing, Narnia, you know. Um, so it was a dream project, actually. But it was so intense shooting and such intense scenes uh, that I actually uh, suffered from insomnia during the whole shooting. So I didn't sleep for eight months. Wow. <laughs> you look so, fine on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was a high pri oh, price okay. to pay. <laughs> wow. So when you're saying something, you mean literally like hot, no sleep at night or a no, couple I, of hours? Yeah, or? maybe like one or two hours tops. So I was really like shaky and into the situation. <laughs> so it was good for the series, yeah. but it was bad for me as a person. Sure. <laughs> Thank God you recovered. Yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, okay. <laughs> this, is a, this is a 10 hour kind of big ambitious show. It, we talked about the filming and the, and the cinematography and everything. Is, do you think TV now, we're going through a kind of golden age of TV where TV is the place where big ambitious stories are being told as opposed to cinema? Yeah, maybe? we see a lot of proof uh, on, on that. So uh, absolutely, and uh, there's so, so many talented uh, filmmakers who go, go into TV now and, and uh, it's getting more and more shows that I need to see, I must see it. And before, it, 10 years ago, it was not so many. So absolutely, it will be really, really interesting to follow this, see where it ends up. Yeah, you know? yeah. And for you, you've you do films as well. You've had very successful films, but it, which, do you have a preference? Do you think TV is where, is the, where the future is for long, big, complicated stories? Unfortunately, in a way, it's been so much harder to finance movies and it's like, it's been so divided between these big blockbuster films and this kind of very, very small indie films. There's no like middle segment anymore. And I think that that middle segment is drawing towards TV instead because it's in a way easier and more secure to finance it. Um, and uh, so you really get the sense that the quality is really flowing into the TV industry. And as an actress, it's... Um, it's so great because in a TV series, you really can get to know your character during a long period of time. You don't have to, uh, when shooting a movie, like every day is so important that you know you nail the character. In a series, you can really like develop with the character and getting to know new things about the character as you go along, and that's really like fulfilling. Mm. We watch a lot of your shows that come out of Scandinavia and, and, and Sweden. <laughs> do you watch any of ours? Do you, do you, what are the favourite things you've seen from of UK course. or US? Of mm. course! Yeah. Sherlock! Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Downtown Abbey. Yeah? Uh, there are so many. I can't... Uh, mm. Yeah. I think, I mean, uh, Sweden and UK are connected in many ways. Pop culture, music, yeah. films, TV, uh, fashion. So uh, in, in, in every pub in Stockholm, there's a British guy pouring up beer, you know. So yeah. we're, we're really yeah. funny. Oh, married, sorry. married to a Swedish girl. <laughs> okay. So, mm. Cool. And in terms of um, the future of the show, has it, has it been, it's been a hit? Has it been recommissioned? Would you like to do more? Would you like to carry on doing, exploring this? No, we're done now. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> no, this is... I need to uh, sleep, so yeah, I can't fair, yeah. she, will, she will sleep <laughs> and I will start writing the next uh, show. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this fair is the beginning. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's any questions from our audience. If you have any questions, we have. I think we have a mic. If you do, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to ask you, since you are uh, from Sweden, uh, I would like to ask both of you, starting from uh, Moa. In your opinion, what is the strongest point of uh, Ingrid Bergman from an actress's point of view, and then from a director's point of view? Thank you. 
Um, I think uh, Ingmar Bergman was one of the first male directors that really wrote complex and amazing parts for females. Mm. Uh, if you watch his movies, it's like mostly his leads are female in a way. And, and that was something new when he first started to direct and that he had this enormously uh, complex way of seeing characters and helping the actresses with their development of the characters. Uh, he was really like precise with psychology. Um, so it's a bummer that I, I didn't get to work uh, with him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in every... Um, we have an icon called Ingmar Bergman, and that's good for, for everybody who works with film in, in Sweden. And without him, we have a lot of great directors during the years, but he is the director. So uh, I think it's always helpful and it's uh, in, in every aspect. You, you say you, you work with film and you come from Sweden, uh, then we can always talk about Ingmar Bergman for a while. But for me personally, I cannot say I'm very influenced by him. Uh, I'm, I'm from a, a different uh, generation, of course, and so on. So, But he's an icon and uh, more of that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? No? Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, as, as well as this kind of the, the, the visual aspect of your Scott, it's very striking when, when uh, Josephine disappears, the, the lighting goes different and so on. Uh, one other thing that struck me is the characters. All the actors are very striking in the way they look. They're all, they're all very enigmatic and um, um, uh, they all seem to have a story when you look at their face. Uh, um, I guess for Henrik, how difficult was the casting side of it? Uh, the casting and, and the pre-production, all in all, is so so important. And, and I had a really clear picture of, of uh, who I wanted uh, to, to play this. And what we did when we was in the writers' room, me and, and my, my co-writers, uh, Alexander Kant, and Fredrik Olsson, that we wrote backstories for almost every major character. And that's also something that I could have helped when, when I, we were was directing. Sometimes, uh, you know, an actor needs a little push in a, in a way and I could tell them something about their backstory <laughs> just to get, get them in the right mood or something but also to, to feel confident, all of us, that there, there, this is a real universe and this character is real. Uh, so and when we did the casting we, we took some really established, famous, award-winning actors, some new fresh faces and also some uh, uh, what was expected or, or seen upon as a bit uh, not odd, but unexpected. For example, we have a pop star who, who never played uh, theater or film before. His name is Yuhio. And uh, there was a lot of press in Sweden around that because he's really huge in the younger segment. And everybody sort of was waiting for Yuhio. And I think his first appearance is in episode seven or something. So, <laughs> so they became fans of the show during, while waiting for Yuhio. And uh, for example, there's another guy. He has the, the world record of being in the uh, in an ad, TV commercial, for the longest time. I think it's uh, maybe someone, no, 10 years or 10 years in the same uh, commercial. And, and uh, I brought him, in, brought him in because he's a great actor, but he never had a real chance to play drama. And that was also a really cool choice. And he was brilliant and people loved it. Uh, so yeah, the, the casting was really fun to put a puzzle together and also to find actors that would work in front of the camera, but, but also love the project for real, because this is a real marathon and it's really heavy work to, to film for nine months in a row. So you have to have chemistry with actors as well. Uh, and and uh, so we really had a tight group of actors who put their soul into this, and I think that's important. Uh, I was going to ask, my final question was going to be, did you have, in this kind of um, genre of storytelling, sometimes I know, I know I've met crime novelists who don't even know the ending yet to their story, and they write the story and then they get to the end. Did you have... You're ending in mind right from the start? The last scene of, of uh, the season we, we had from the very, very, f the first day of writing seven years ago. So we, re we, we know where it would end up. Uh, what we, me and the scriptwriters did was take my first draft, which was approximately one hour, and made 10 hours out, out of it. So we, we had the backbone that we could stretch in a good way uh, and, and, of course, find uh, subplots and so on. But the, uh, the plot of Eva Turnblad and 